Hello, welcome to at and Threat Track for November 18th, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today we're joined by John Hogeboom. Hi, John. Hi, glad to be here. Matt. How's it going? How are you been, Matt? Matt Kaiser and uh, Jim Clausing online. Welcome, Jim. And I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, well, we're going into Thanksgiving vacation next week here and uh, looking forward to a nice calm break. You know, I, I reflect on this a little bit. The, um, it, it, there was a time when as soon as the colleges went out, mm. the botnet activity went up. Yeah. And uh, it's become a lot more organized. A lot, it's not as if it's a weekend hobby activity. Most of the real activities, I think, if people are making a living, they're skipping the college part. Uh, for the folks that are doing this sort of thing. Uh, not uh, what I would recommend, but uh, certainly as we go into uh, the holidays, this is one of the things that kind of reflects in my mind. There's always that opportunity. I think, uh, you know, if you're in, uh, responsible for protecting an enterprise, that's one of the things to be thinking about is what, how are you going to respond to an incident if it happens to occur over the holidays? And I think, you know, reflecting again on the Target incident last year, that was a case where I'm sure that ruined some people's holidays. And uh, so uh, you, something you might want to keep in mind, not, not let it ruin the holidays for you. So in any case, let's uh, go into the first uh, set of activities here. And I think patching is one of the things you want to do to try to prevent something from ruin ruining your holidays. How about that, Jim? <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, we talked last week uh, about the Microsoft patches. And one of the ones that I mentioned was uh, MS14-066, the S-channel one. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the days since we recorded that, um, some more information has come out about it, and it, I, I now think it's more serious than uh, what I was concerned with last week. It appears that there uh, were multiple issues in there, you know, multiple vulnerabilities, although the bulletin only included one CVE. But it looks like there were a couple of things, including a, a certificate validation issue, hmm. and so um, you know that one. That one is one that I'm more concerned with now than I was a week ago when it first came out. When I was first reading through the bulletins, uh, there was a, a nice blog post by uh, Beyond Trust that they went in and reverse engineered the patch and did a, a lot of the work. They, they show what the bad guys have been doing for years, you know, so they go through and uh, take a good look at the certificate validation issue in there. So if you have not yet applied MS 14 dash 066, you ought to do it. Now there were some issues with it. Uh, some folks were uh, reporting, um, performance issues with mm -hmm. their uh, Microsoft SQL Server after having applied this patch. Uh, there were also some reports of issues with uh, certain clients um, trying to connect to uh, servers with the, um, that enabled some of the new TLS uh, Cypher suites that I had mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. um, just today, Microsoft has actually uh, updated the patch and re-released it. Uh, so if you're running uh, Server 2008 R2 or Server 2012, you should reapply the, the patch. They've fixed some of the issues with the TLS Cypher suites. It's not clear yet whether they've done anything about the, um, the reported performance issues. But, um, yeah, that, that one is one that turned out uh, to be more uh, significant than I originally mm -hmm. thought it was going to be last week when I was first looking it over. Okay. Now, Jim, on this, uh, on this particular one, it, it, you pointed out obviously more serious, but you also pointed out that there may be some performance issues or perhaps some client compatibility. So if you are looking at your environment and uh, feel that you have a, a reasonable perimeter around that, I mean, what, are there workarounds that you can suggest that that uh, perhaps, or, you know, is it really critical that you patch it? Is this something well, that's going to really... Well, it, it really is critical. Um, yeah, this one I, I liken to, uh, you know, some of the, like the Heartbleed, you know, the, some of the other SSL 
library stuff that we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. What this S channel module does for Windows is provide um, you know the SSL and TLS for uh, for some of the other services that are running on the system. There's some uh, conflicting reports about whether IIS itself actually does use the S channel uh, for its um, SSL or not, but um, but basically, if th this is this is an issue that even with the performance if potential performance problems. Um, if you leave it unpatched, you better have firewalled off, uh, except for, you know, a really limited group of folks who absolutely have to connect to it mm -hmm. because it does, it does provide a potentially, um, a way into some of these services that you think are encrypted. Okay. So it, it, patch, unless you really have a good understanding of what the control around access to your database might be or what applications you're using. Is it a reasonable assessment? Yeah, yeah, that, I, I, I would say that's that's a reasonable one. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, and the other thing I mentioned when we were talking about the patches last week, that two of the bulletin numbers uh, had been skipped, that uh, there were 14 bulletins, but two of, uh, and two more of them that said they'd be released at a later date. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them has been released today, and this one actually is kind of significant. Uh, MS-14-068 was released today, and this is one that is uh, a vulnerability in the Windows Kerberos implementation, which is uh, you know, the underlying um, technology behind uh, domain controllers. Mm -hmm. There was an issue with the way that the domain controllers parsed a certain portion of a, what they call a service ticket that would allow um, an attacker to uh, elevate their privileges on a server, um, potentially up to domain administrator. Hmm. So this one is a big deal. You absolutely need to apply this one to your domain controllers sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. Okay. There are uh, limited targeted exploits uh, have been seen in the wild, so the bad guys are already aware of it. Um, so this one is, is a really big deal for your domain controllers, mm -hmm. and this one, uh, as I said, came out today. Not sure why it got pulled from, from last week's, but it is out now. Okay. So let me make sure I understand correctly. This is, if I understand, if I heard you correctly, you said it's a, a uh, basically a privilege escalation as opposed to a unauthorized access. Is that right? Right, right. You, you do have to be able to uh, successfully get a service ticket from a domain controller. So you have mm -hmm. to have um, some, some sort credentials of that you can authenticate against the the CD or the KDC the the key distribution center, which is mm -hmm. part of the domain controller. But then once you've got a ticket, you can forge pieces of the, the service ticket um, and change some of the things that in theory you shouldn't be able to change. So it's, it's an issue with um, the, the domain controller, the uh, signs this uh, privilege attribute certificate Mm -hmm. but then doesn't actually uh, validate its signature properly. Okay. So, so you, you get back this service ticket from the domain controller, you modify the piece of it, and you send it on to whatever other server you're trying to get access to, and you can authenticate to that as a domain admin instead of as an ordinary user, All right. for example. I got it. Yeah, I, I mean, I can only imagine this sounds like something that would be kind of tricky to patch because you could quickly get into some kind of incompatibility activities. And my suspicion is the reason it took a little while to get it out is getting a patch in place that it wasn't going to disrupt an entire domain. Just to guess. Yeah, not, not sure exactly what the what took so long, but um, yeah. So they this patch, though, as I said, it's a big deal. You really do want to get this on your domain controllers. Right. Uh, as soon as possible. 
All right, very good. Thank you, Jim. So let's go over to Matt here. And uh, Matt, I guess uh, there's never a shortage of malware, and more and more it's trying to just keep you away from your own stuff. <laughs> right. So this is uh, this article from WebRoot. Um, they're talking about another um, cryptographic locker style malware in the vein right. of CryptoLocker or CryptoWall. Um, this one is interesting for a very particular reason, which I'll get to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's pretty standard, though. You know, encrypts all of your files. Um, it, out, it asks you to pay up a ransom in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which is fairly untraceable. Um, and it also increases the amount you have to pay if you wait longer. So mm -hmm. you, know, you wait a day, it bumps up the price. You wait another day, it bumps the price up again. Mm. Uh, what's interesting about this one is that it offers one free decrypt. Any one file on your machine that's been encrypted, it'll give you a menu and say, okay, which one do you want? The one that has your Bitcoin Exactly, holding. the one you need it to pay the guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the smart move. Um, but uh, actually, it's interesting because this is, I think, a model that we've seen elsewhere in crime, um, mm -hmm. particularly in, I want to say, drug dealing, where you know, the first one is free. And that, right, that right. compels you to realize, oh, wow, you know, maybe I should be doing this for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, what I think from a malware analysis perspective is kind of interesting, and I've yet to actually take a look at the samples, but the fact that the key is present for that one free decrypt uh, suggests that there's a way that you could potentially get at that key Possibly. and then unlock all of your files without right. having to pay anything at all. And, and if you get to pick the file, it does sort of suggest that they there, there has to be a means to be able to facilitate that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, good point. So Assuming it's the same key for every file. Right. Now, that is a good point. Right. Yeah. It could be changed, but it, that, it's an awful lot of work just for that one feature. So I, I'd be uh, willing to suspect that Willing to suspect. How's that for soft? <laughs> I'm willing to suspect that there's an opportunity to be able to reverse it. Right. So, good good deal. So, in any case, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some updates on uh, as the community digs into this a little bit further and gets uh, a little better understanding. If we don't even have if we don't have the opportunity ourselves, in fact. So. All right. Very good. Uh, so, uh, John, let's uh, go over to you here and uh, talk a little bit about, I guess. On one hand, we're trying to, I guess they're trying to hide your files, but in some cases, you're trying to hide who you are. Right. <laughs> so we've talked about Tor before, right. and Tor is the onion router. Uh, for the uninitiated, Tor is kind of this virtual anonymization network. It's created on top of the internet. You can run a client on your machine that participates in the Tor network, and it'll allow you to anonymize your traffic uh, through the Tor cloud um, uh, and that it egresses at some point or it exits and that becomes real traffic. So as a participant in the internet, you, your be computer becomes basically a router on top of the routed network and traffic routes Yes and no, should... you don't have to be. So uh, you can just be a client and uh, participate in the right. Tor network and use it as a means to you know, transit your traffic. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily, when you fire it up, have to become part of the network to allow other people to communicate through you. Mm -hmm. um, in any event. The crux of this story, though, is some of the, they had done some research, and I can't remember, um, it's uh, uh, someone from a particular uh, uh, research organization, uh, last name is Chuck, Rav, Chuck Roverty, mm -hmm. and he had done some analysis to try to figure out, is there a way to uh, determine, looking at Tor traffic, to figure out who the actual source IP is that generated that traffic? Mm -hmm. And they did some statistical analysis here. I'll break down the crux of his work and why I think it's not entirely practical for, for the mainstream people to use as a means to guess uh, who's generating traffic. But we kind of have a picture here. If you look at Tor, what happens is you have your client. He connects to an entry node. That communication is mm -hmm. encrypted. And then it kind of ping pongs around through the other nodes inside the Tor network until it hits an exit node. Mm -hmm. And then at the exit node, it becomes decrypted and goes out to whatever it really needs and then the response comes back, back and forth like that. So what he decided to do is if you have a very um, well-funded adversary, let's say, who can have visibility into large portions of the internet, mm -hmm. which is gonna be a pretty small population of people who could do that, um, if they could collect NetFlow from entry nodes, so traffic entering various tour entry nodes that are mm -hmm. known, um, and then you have some uh, control or you have your own exit node that maybe you control and you're watching that stuff and collecting net flow from that. 
what you can do is just looking at those and trying to pair a flow that comes in and a flow that leaves is not going to work because it comes in in one form and it leaves another form. Right. Uh, but what, what he did is he did some statistical analysis and said, well, uh, you can make a few rogue entry nodes of your own that do traffic shaping. So as the traffic comes in from the victim machine, it'll do um, bandwidth throttling. So it'll say, okay, maybe I'll give you one kilobits, and then I'll give you two kilobits, and then I'll give you one kilobit and two kilobits. And it makes this kind of mm -hmm. waveform or this kind of square waveform. And I kind of have a picture there of a, uh, an example of that. So on the way in from your NetFlow, you would kind of see this square waveform. And on your way out, you'd see that square waveform. You'd be able to kind of align those two together and figure mm -hmm. out, hey, this, this connection that left is actually pairing with this connection that entered this other entry node here that you'd have to have control of both entry and exit nodes right. uh, in order for this to really work practically. So that, that's not quite how I understood the paper. I, I hate to contradict okay. you. But my understanding was you needed to have visibility on the entry nodes, and then you need to control one malicious server at the other end. And it's the responses from that server that get modulated bandwidth-wise. So you don't actually have to control... Oh, that's true. Nodes. Yes, yes, you can do that, right. Right, mm -hmm. so you can control, if you had a rogue uh, on, your, on your exit side, like a colluding server, they put it there, that could be doing that throttling on the way back right. out to you know, control the bandwidth rate as it goes so back out. So effectively a watering hole type thing, if you can draw, you if you can draw the client to right, it. Right, right, that's a good point. I, I, I forgot that, that particular aspect of it. But you still need to have visibility into the NetFlow entering various entry nodes yep. uh, right. in order to do any kind of pairing on this stuff. So in the reality of the situation, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be able to have really great visibility into it. Mm -hmm. But if you did have really good visibility into NetFlow for very different portions of the internet, statistically, you can probably figure out about 81% of them. Based on, and that's you know, based on a very controlled type of uh, uh, experiment that he did mm -hmm. here. So. Yeah. And this is a traditional topic or study, I mean, referred to as transmission security. And there are all kinds of little subtle things like that. I remember, you know, way back when it was, uh, it was actually had to do with, uh, in radio communications, it had to do with sort of the sequence of events, particularly in analog communications. You could see because the, the semiconductors had particular patterns associated with them, you could see how the things would ramp up and, you know, the, the decay activities associated with waves. It wasn't all of a sudden there's a wave. It, the, thing has to warm up and actually create the wave and so you could pick up on signatures like that and say hey I know that radio and it's different from that radio and it's a it's a similar kind of thing here where you're in this case injecting a characteristic into the network that allows it to be picked up on either end and fundamentally you have to really kind of assess is that a risk that's significant for my particular circumstances so it's good study good study but uh, I, I think under you know, typical circumstances. It doesn't really take away from the, the real effectiveness that, that TOR provides. Uh, I think one of the interesting key points was that in order for them to actually get the proper uh, characteristic waveform, or they have a step function as well that they were using, you'd have to have a single session, a single um, download mm -hmm. that lasts over a span of time. Right. right? Otherwise, right. you have a, a pretty big file right. download or right. something. Right. So you have to be downloading something of a significant size. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if it, if you're if you're using Tor and then you've got you know you're downloading something that's taking you know much longer than you expect. If you was you'd probably be able to see it, wouldn't you? That you would have this modulation on your end. If you were able to if you're mod yeah if you're monitoring your network there activity, which a lot of Windows this is a case, you know, yeah, you absolutely. Can. If you, you had if you were concerned about this type of thing, you might be able to look and see if there are if there's a a, a significant amount of jitter or a significant amount of um, uh, I'm forgetting what the other parameters, but impairments that would it's be like indicative of somebody trying to create signatures like that. That's actually a very good point. So that's a potential countermeasure that uh, for the countermeasures. And they, a, they did I mention that, like you're saying, with the throttling, they can do a little trick there on the exit nodes to, on like HTTP requests that somebody might make, is on the page that they return, inject a little iframe mm -hmm. in there that says, go get this large file in the background kind of thing. So you might not even be any of the wiser that you're going to whatever, you know, xyz.com website mm -hmm. and this rogue exit node is kind of injected an invisible iframe that's saying, go download this 100 meg file. 
uh, from a colluding server that they have that's under their control that they're going to do this throttling on, and then they mm -hmm. can kind of do that backtracking and figure out you know, who it is, right. assuming they've got the net flow from all the, the both sides of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, let's go on to the next story here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess we're trying to keep track of what's going on in the app market, mm -hmm. uh, looking for malicious apps. And uh, it seems kind of rare, but maybe you have a different opinion. Well, you know, <laughs> I don't have a different opinion, uh, but some people on the internet apparently do. Now, yeah. there was a particular company that released a report uh, making some pretty strong claims about the percentage of apps that had been hacked. Now, mm -hmm. when somebody says apps that have been hacked, you know, I immediately have a feeling in the back of my mind that says, what exactly are they saying when they say these apps have been hacked? This kind of suggests I have a bunch of malware on my device. Exactly, or, right. or that somewhere their servers have been broken into, mm -hmm. or that the, the app itself in the app store has been compromised and downloading will infect your device. I read the paper. What it seems to be saying is that the apps themselves have been downloaded, modified, and then made available on either a third-party app store or right. within a torrent site or some other out-of-bands means of obtaining the application. Now, this is you know fairly common. You, you'll probably see a game like Angry Birds been repackaged several times by somebody mm -hmm. who either wants to make money off of objecting extra ad code in or a rootkit you know, to, to gain control of the device. Now, wouldn't that still constitute sort of a copyright theft to do that sort it's of certain, thing? It, it okay. would, it's, that's a, but that's, a, I think, outside of the scope sort of Sort of on the side, of, okay. It's, but it's, <laughs> it's still another, another you know, criminal act. Right. Um, but here, um, they, they made a claim that you know, somewhere up in the 90% in the range of apps have been hacked. Hmm. Um, with a little closer reading, you find out what they did is they took a sample of a total of 360 apps, mm -hmm. and that's between the um, from iOS and Android. Most likely some of the more popular ones. Exactly. Right. So it was, I think it was the top 100 of the paid apps from the mm -hmm. iOS app store and the Android app store, the top 20 free apps from each, and then the top 20 apps in the categories of, I think, healthcare, re retail, and banking. Hmm. from each of those as well. And then they, they took a look to see if they could find modified versions of those in third-party stores, torrents, okay. et cetera. So I think, I think it's really important to pay close attention to exactly what claims are being made. Because mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've already been asked before, you know, I didn't even read this report, and holy, you know, all these apps, they've been hacked. And I say, well, what does that mean to you? And what does right. it actually mean? So I think a lot of, um, there's, there are companies that will take the facts and spin them a certain way to make it mm -hmm. you know, beneficial to whatever it is that they happen to be selling. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's sales, uh, mm -hmm. marketing. But I think if it's an, you know, as a consumer, it behooves most people to take a little look and understand exactly what's being said here, what mm -hmm. claims are being made. Right. Well, and by counterpoint, I guess I, 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 I think still, I mean, considering the, the apps that were selected, mm -hmm. uh, some of them associated with, I presume, re reputable healthcare providers, financial service providers, if you're getting them from another place, it may not be the same app that you were intending to get from perhaps the mainstream market. And that's correct. I mean, I think most people, I, I believe that most people are still sticking mostly to the official app stores mm -hmm. on mobile platforms. I know some people are not, and, but I would recommend that if you intend to use an app for something that is sensitive, you make an extra effort to ensure that it came from where you think it came from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There, there's plenty of reasons to stay with those app stores in the first place, but for those critical applications particularly. All right. Now, to take a look at the uh, sort of the other end of it, and uh, honestly, I don't even know what this, this company is marketing, but the, um, as an enterprise, if you have apps that are out there, perhaps it makes sense to kind of look around and see if somebody has taken your app and has repackaged it and marketing it in another way. I think so. I think that someone else out there is misrepresenting your own brand. And if they mm -hmm. find that something's you know, different or wrong with their device as a result of these applications, they'll come to you and they'll say, what, what is the matter with your application? You'll have to say, actually, that's not really entirely our application, mm -hmm. even though it looks and smells and functions like it actually is. Right. Um, you can take steps to try and harden your app against this kind of modification, you know, encrypt certain variables. There are, there are standards out there for, for how to behave and secure your app against this sort of modification mm -hmm. and, and subversion. It's not perfect. I mean, once you've got the binary on another system and you can mess around with it, mm -hmm. uh, someone's going to, who's properly motivated, is going to be able to do that. All right, absolutely. All right, I think that's a very interesting story and one of the things that uh, we'll want to be paying attention to a little bit forward as time goes on.
absolutely. So let's take a look at the internet weather for the last week or so here. And uh, first item here is uh, we've seen very recently a, a resurgence of scan probes on port 1521 TCP. This is Oracle database, and uh, it's really just a few sources from China. This is not something that seems to be ramping up significantly, and I think it almost seems like every quarter we come around and uh, have a sort of a resurgence of this activity. And by the way, uh, 60 days of the activity is shown, so you can see that there are, you know, there there are spikes here and there of uh, scanning activity, but a relatively large spike uh, just recently, just today. Uh, that was picked up on. So uh, I don't know, Jim, uh, we were collaborating a little bit earlier about uh, some of the um, uh, recent patches that uh, may have come out. Right, yes. The the Oracle quarterly patches came out uh, on October 14th, mm -hmm. and there were uh, 154 fixes in all across all their, their various um, products. But there were uh, a number of them specifically related to their legacy database, and uh, a couple of them were were significant, and I suspect that that's what this scanning is about. There were six CVEs that had a, a CVSS score, a, a, an exploitability score, of up uh, over nine when, for Oracle running on Windows, but we're only 6.5 for Oracle running on uh, Linux or Unix. So, and uh, two of these CVEs allowed for um, unauthenticated um, remote exploitation. So, yeah. you know, we see this, as you said, we see the scanning pretty much every quarter after the, after the patches come out. And I, so I, I really do suspect that that's what this one is, is, somebody's finally looking for uh, especially those windows boxes where this these vulnerabilities appear to be um, mm -hmm. more easily exploitable all right well thank you for that and uh, I guess that as a general theme I think um, you know exposing a database to the internet directly is probably uh, not a particularly desirable thing to do there probably are better ways to be able to control that either provide an authentication mechanism in front of it or uh, provide a front-end application that helps to control the access and and how it's accessed but um, generally speaking uh, certainly patching the system would be the first uh, first line of defense uh, certainly from even an insider attack perhaps uh, next item here is uh, sources and probes on port 53413 TCP. This particular port's not registered or particularly known for any particular application. Uh, it was identified as a back door for a particular type of router, a, a router that's uh, marketed under the Net, Netis brand. And uh, this is a Chinese made router. So it actually is consequently seems to be most popular in uh, Asia more popular than it is in the United States. And I'm sure you, I'll show you a geographic map in a moment here. But the significance is we had reported on this a couple of other times, and there is some regular probing activity that's taking place. But uh, what we're seeing here, just on uh, starting on November 11th, is a, uh, a botnet that's, uh, uh, I'll say, joined the party. This is a case where they've basically got uh, at least a thousand or so uh, devices that were commanded to go scan for this particular port more than likely looking for uh, vulnerable devices uh, with this back door that's been open here. And uh, you can see sort of the, the, the telltale sign of the you know, decay, those bots basically finishing their task and uh, dropping out of the scanning activity. And uh, I guess I'll point out is that the scan pattern, some of the behaviors associated with that scanning activity are clearly different from what we had previously been seeing. So uh, it appears that perhaps another group or at least certainly new uh, software is being used in, uh, in doing that uh, scanning activity. And uh, here's what those, uh, basically those sources look like on a geographic map. And uh, yellow here means there's more density of the, uh, of the activity, whereas red is a lighter density, uh, as shown on the scale in the bottom here. And you can see that the heavier density is in India and China, and uh, there's certainly a lot of distribution in Europe, not so much in the United States. In fact, we hardly have any over on the West Coast or in the Midwest, and uh, there's even uh, perhaps even more along the uh, eastern border of, the, of South America. So uh, that's, you know, based on uh, commercial geographic mapping, it's not necessarily accurate, but I think it uh, provides a pretty decent representation. 
So um, not so many of those devices in the United States, but uh, certainly something uh, to be paying attention to and nevertheless. Uh, I, my recommendation is do vulnerability scanning and uh, get an idea what ports are open on devices before deploying those. Uh, next item here is uh, scan probes on port 135 TCP, and this is uh, activity we've seen over the last few weeks here. A little bit strange. Uh, this isn't, um, you know, the uh, amount of scanning activity on port 135 has certainly settled down over time, uh, but uh, we've been reporting on this for a few weeks now. There was an episode of it uh, in the late summer as well that we've been talking about. Most of the probes here are from a common U.S. cloud provider, so it almost suggests that there's some sort of a systemic issue that had been picked picked up on and perhaps compri compromises devices. I'm speculating a little bit on that and then um, are, are using those to perhaps look for others that have uh, similar characteristics. And looking at the top 10 most probe ports, uh, at the top of the list here we have port 135 TCP, which is uh, what we just talked about, uh, followed by, by port 443 TCP, that's uh, encrypted web followed by port 22 and port 23, that's SSH and Telnet respectively, and then followed by port 9064 TCP, and that's associated with a, uh, a proxy application. We're gonna take a little bit of a closer look at that at the moment. Uh, followed by port 1433 TCP, that's Microsoft SQL Database, followed by port 53 TCP, that's uh, DNS, and then port 80 TCP, sort of paired up with port 443 port 445, and then finally port 3389, which is a remote desktop protocol. Uh, not any real big movement other than port 9064 moved up six points uh, or six places in the, uh, the ranking from last week. So we'll take a little bit of a look at the timeline for this port 9064 TCP. And uh, we're looking at the last 90 days of activity uh, in terms of the number of probes that have been taking place. And as you can see back in, uh, when we started reporting on this back in uh, August, actually is in early September, I should say, uh, mid-September, uh, we started to see this activity picking up. It has uh, continued to increase up to about the end of October dropped off for a period and now we're seeing increasing activity again. So uh, it appears that it's you know effectively one group that's doing this or one actor that's uh, performing this activity. Uh, they perhaps took a little bit of break and maybe are, have changed their uh, uh, approach to it a little bit, uh, but continue to look for these proxy devices. And uh, I think John, you had taken a little bit of a look at this uh, some time ago. And yeah, I mean, port 9064, for whatever reason, which I have yet to determine, although I think there might be some malware involved, but that's a little bit uh, speculative. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a bunch of proxy servers running on port 9064. I'm not familiar right. with any legitimate proxy software that uses that. The scanning that we've been seeing and the honeypots, I was looking at some of that. It's a little interesting. Some of the recent scanning has been, it's proxy scanning, but what they're doing is they're actually trying to fetch... Um, uh, fetch a URL from a particular host mm -hmm. uh, with the URL that they fetch is like slash 9064. Right. And I guess probably you look at 9065 or whatever the other ports are, they try to get slash whatever. And maybe on the back end of that server, they're just looking at where they get hits from. And that's right. how they know that that was a proxy server that made that that's request or whatever. Work. Yeah. All right. So, uh, you know, the, Generally speaking, proxies aren't that big of an issue other than it can be used to anonymize uh, nefarious activity. And certainly if you are uh, either wittingly or unwittingly operating a proxy, uh, you could actually become a participant in that activity and uh, run the risk of being blocked or, uh, or perhaps worse, having uh, uh, somebody come to your door uh, and maybe even not knocking about it. Right. So, <laughs> so I get, again, recommendation here is to uh, keep, uh, keep an eye on what type of activity is taking place on your network, and if you see activity proxying through it, certainly uh, you want to put a damper on that. There are legitimate reasons for you, for proxying, by the way, uh, you know, in order to, uh, but in the Tor network is a similar thing. Uh, to be able to uh, bypass censorship, you know, in the uh, in the world of free speech, not the entire world is that way. So uh, that's um, that's one of the uh, more legitimate uses. Uh, looking at the top ten most sources probing, 
uh, at the top of the list here, but unchanged from last week is port 23 TCP. Uh, we've looked at the last 30 days of activity and we're going to look at that again here in a few moments, uh, followed by port 445 TCP, which is uh, typically in this list. And uh, actually nothing else really notable. We see port 80 TCP here and port 8080 TCP also in the top 10. A number of uh, types of uh, ICMP uh, either scanning or responses, we see ICMP-8, that's a ping request. Uh, ICMP-0 is a response uh, for a ping. And then we see some uh, ICMP type 3s, which are generally associated with either scanning activity or with uh, denial of service attacks and uh, basically indicating that the, uh, the service is unreachable. So taking a little closer to port 23 TCP, we're looking at the last 180 days of activity. And uh, as you can see, back in uh, about the middle, middle to the end of August, we saw quite a bit of activity here. This was sort of the peak of the year in terms of the number of sources that were doing probing on port 23. And this was associated with, uh, you know, devices that were being compromised, you know, the internet of insecure things, if you will, and uh, being used for, uh, uh, to gather them into a botnet that died off a little bit. And then uh, over the last couple of weeks here, it's ramped up again and we're seeing uh, up to the the uh, same no uh, level here, and the scale here, by the way, is uh, about 60,000 sources that we're seeing at peak uh, that are doing this probing activity, which is a pretty significant number. I think even when we look at like config or infections, we're only seen on the order of 30,000 or so um, at, at any given time. And that's based on basically a snapshot, snapshot in that particular point in time. Devices could be turned off and other things, so uh, it is a pretty significant number here. So that's your show for today. If uh, I would like, excuse me, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com and you can find ThreatTrack on the ATT Tech channel. It's att.com slash threattrack. It's also available on YouTube as well as iTunes. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. And I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Jim, online. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, John. I'm Brian Rexroad. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.